Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Living Room, it's a support and education program designed specifically with people diagnosed and or really at risk for lung cancer in mind. Typically, as those of you who are veterans to this programming, we have a guest speaker uh, come in and talk about varying aspects of the disease. Tonight, uh, you get me and uh, my co-host here who um, hasn't been sitting uh, next to me for quite a while since I think before yeah. COVID. So we yeah. are thrilled to have uh, the illustrious Bonnie Adario, co-founder and survivor of Go Team for Lung Cancer, um, sitting back with us tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about a year of hope and we're going to really discuss a lot of what myself and my colleagues have been working on this year and the reach and impact we've had into our community. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the exciting um, developments that happened even outside of GoTo. I know you all know, or I hope you all know, and if you don't, come find out, about all the support, services, and education that GoTo provides. But I don't know if you know about all the other things GoTo does. And we did something similar last year where you got to meet sort of the leaders um, of the GoTo organization. And I thought it was apropos that this year we take a dive into some of our successes. And, and like I said at the beginning of this, the impact that we are having and, and hope to continue to have in an even greater way um, moving forward. So with that, I'm going to jump into this ridiculously long um, PowerPoint presentation that I opted not to put up on the slide, on the Thank you. thing, because <laughs> it's like death by PowerPoint, right? But I do need it. I can tell you and answer questions to whatever you want to know about the support services department but I depend on my colleagues to just give me high level uh, information on theirs. And we're gonna start with science and research. And I think most of you know that GoTo Science and Research Department works really closely with our sister uh, organization, the Adario Lung Cancer Medical Institute. So you'll hear about some of the work um, that GoTo's doing, some of the work that Alchemy is doing, and then you'll see where that crossover is and the work that we are doing together. Our overall impact is that we've had, in 2023, 14 scientific presentations. We submitted 14 abstracts, so obviously everything was accepted. Uh, we published five manuscripts, and we were invited um, to nine speaking engagements. So I think for a relatively small organization that speaks volumes um, about the capabilities uh, of our science and research team. Um, over 43 go-to centers of excellence, and we're gonna talk a little bit about our excellence in healthcare delivery team, but this is some inter-organizational crossover work that happens. So over 43 of our go-to centers of excellence um, and a few other clinical sites have been engaged across six active research studies in 2023. Over 877 people with lung cancer are participating in active go-to clinical research studies in 2023, which is to me an incredibly proud thing to be able to say because those of you who are, who, who are not new to this, this space, no, we talk over and over again about studies that never even get off the ground because they, they have trouble recruiting people to participate in studies. So I think that's a really huge number for us. We secured $1.3 million in industry funds uh, to launch our Six Seed study. The Six Seed study is set up to establish um, a plasma-based biobank for small cell lung cancer translational research, and this is important, and I know some of you know that we've really taken small cell and wrapped our arms around it and are trying to create in small cell what we now have in non-small cell that really didn't exist when you, right. when you started this, this foundation. So exactly. um, we're incredibly proud of this study. And then the science and research team worked with our health healthcare delivery team in our centers of excellence to develop a patient-centered research designation. So community centers around the country can work towards this designation and what it effectively is doing is bringing research into the community where we know the patients are. You know, you say all the time, and I don't know if this stat's still true, so don't quote me on it, but it was not that long ago that 50% of all clinical trials happen in 10 states. Still true. Yeah, and like how are people supposed to access this life-saving, right, type of, of research studies and, and access these, these therapies? Um, if they're only in, in 10 states. So us being able to bring this type of designation and this type of research into the communities where the people are is a huge, huge step in, in the right direction. We have done a lot of work, and I think you guys have heard me talk about this in health equity and disparities. And I know 
At some point during um, COVID, it became pretty big buzzwords. We heard it like all over the place and GoTo has taken it incredibly seriously. Um, we have um, been working with, for about the last two years, uh, a health equity consulting firm called FSG. Please don't ask me what that stands for because I do not know. But they really took the first year to do this deep dive looking at lung cancer in disparate communities across the country so that we could make better judgment calls on where our work would be best served and most most benefit the people at risk or diagnosed with lung cancer. Year one work, a manuscript um, was published and it's called Health Inequities Across the Lung Cancer Care Continuum in 10 Marginalized Populations, a Narrative View. Why they always wow. make these so long, right. <laughs> and that's why I have to read it because I can't remember. But we're, we're really, really proud of that and we're working on a second uh, paper right now for publication. We secured 14 new community partnerships with um, a project called Ready Lung. And this again is pointing towards some of the inequities work that we're doing through science and research. And you'll see it as I'm talking through the different depart departmental work, how the health equity stuff sort of rolls up into it. But this is really looking at assessing co the community's readiness to address disparities, right? First, we have to figure out how ready they are or are not to serve the people that actually live within, um, within their communities. We secured another $350,000 to launch Program Connect. And this one's really interesting because it's looking right now to educate, engage, enroll, and evaluate screening treatment outcomes in marginalized communities. This is the screening and, and, and challenges around healthcare is not a one size fits all problem or solution, right? Um, each of these communities has very different yet clear challenges when it comes to act, not only accessing healthcare, but being delivered appropriate and quality healthcare. So, <coughs> Um, this is geared towards looking at that. And then um, we identified the top 21 counties experiencing lung cancer disparities that led to an abstract publication um, and will formalize a lot of our partnership strategies for 2024. Our research team has been very busy. Yes. Um, lung Match, with I think, which I think a lot of you are familiar with, this is a program run through the science and research department with very close ties to patient support service. So our Lung Match navigators are there as an extension of our helpline support to help you navigate through um, next generation uh, sequencing reports. What does this biomarker testing mean? What does this report actually say? How can you educate me on what, what my results are so that I can have a better conversation? But also, and I don't wanna say more importantly, but equally as important, to help peop people navigate the clinical trial space. Anybody who's ever go gone to clinicaltrials.gov um, or will go to clinicaltrials.gov to try to figure out how to navigate that is an impossibility, even for a lot of healthcare providers. It's not very intuitive. Um, it's not easy to navigate. Um, and quite often the results are often challenging to, to understand. So our navigators will take this personalized approach and will talk with you in detail about what treatments you've had, you know, how many treatments you've had, what line of therapy you're on, any complications you may or may not have had, and then they will work with you to identify clinical trials within a radius that is appropriate for you and what your wishes are. I love this program so much, and I, it's, it's, it's actually one of my pet peeve areas, and uh, Matt, who uh, is one of my science and research colleagues, he's been on since September, and he's now overseeing this program. He's fantastic, and we both have been noodling on and have great aspirations to expand this program as much as possible because I think the benefit is so worth it to the patient. We had 158 referrals to lung match navigation this year. I'm really, really proud to say that 56% of those were new contacts. So these are people that didn't already know us, so over half. And some of our um, patients have helped us have helped get there. refer, sure, of course. And I know Mary we've got phone buddies others. in the room mm -hmm. and probably phone buddies watching, um, and, and we're gonna talk a little bit about support services at the end. That's part of that mentorship program right. when your phone buddy gets to a you know, a crossroads into the decision-making process to then go and refer back and, to and, Lung Match. And, and very often when the patient is chatting with one of these people, and, and, and Larry knows this, um, very often the patient has absolutely no idea. Their physician who, who initially diagnosed them has no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on about all of the things that even the doctors out there don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a huge step in the right direction yeah. for us. Yeah, I agree. Um, we hear from healthcare providers all the time. 
particularly through some of the work we do through our Center of Excellence Network, about their own challenges and barriers to identifying appropriate clinical trial options for their patients. So we really see ourselves as, as, as an extension um, of healthcare teams within yeah. these communities across, across the country and really um, around the world, and we'll get into some of that global stuff uh, later, but I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. One of the other um, programs, and Matt, again, is overseeing Renee, who's working on this, and it's called Nuestra Gente. Do you like my Spanish accent? Nuestra Gente. I'm just checking, <laughs> see if you like my Spanish <laughs> accent. But it's really a pilot, like, Spanish language-based program geared at, at, you know, one of the barriers to care is language, right? Absolutely. And we, th we, there are pockets, large pockets, you know, around this country where Spanish is, is the first language um, right. for people diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, it's an um, audiovisual resource library where we've got um, in print and videos geared t t towards the Spanish speaking population to educate them on their disease. We were actually awarded, and this is happening in January. Matt's going to go represent on behalf of GoTo Science and Research Team, but from Santa Fe, um, their Health Equity um, Accelerator Award. And it was a $50,000 award specifically for this work from Santa Fe in, in health equity. So we're also incredibly um, proud of that. And for that. anybody that doesn't know what Santa Fe is, it's a, a pharmaceutical company. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then there's our registry. So a lot of you who are uh, veterans back from the old ALCF days remember me talking and probably hemming, hemming and hawing mm -hmm. about having to learn what skip logic meant and how to actually build a registry in the hours that were spent trying to take what I knew about lung cancer and put it into some sort of software platform. And we all know I know very little about technology. But um, our lung cancer registry to date has about uh, 20, a little over 2,600 total users representing over 60 countries. So the registry is available in, oh, and if Heather's watching, is it five or seven languages? It's either five or seven languages. So we've got yeah. 60 countries represented. Um, one of the things that we did, because we listen, we talk to people diagnosed, we want to hear feedback, we listen to what you were saying. And the, 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 the sort of baseline survey where we're just trying to gather as much information about your diagnosis and, and sort of the pathway that not only led you there, but what it has been since, was one big long survey. And survey fatigue is a real, real thing. So. Heather um, has worked really hard at creating a modular sort of approach to this. And since we've done that, um, enrollment has gone up considerably, I think that's on here, 192.5% increase in participation since we did that. So we heard, we listened, um, it's working. We released a, a new survey module, again, on small cell lung cancer um, this year about, around treatment, decision making, and access to care. We uh, established a partnership with Loyola Marymount University um, looking at lung cancer stigma research, and we received a half a million dollars to launch lung cancer risk survey, incorporating low-dose CT scans um, on AI-compatible platforms. So this has been our dream for a long time to take imaging and attach it to these patient-reported outcomes so that when we are sharing this information with the research community, they're looking at both and hopefully um, can discover new things. So we have seven surveys um, in the registry right now. So the baseline survey that I talked about, um, an ALK specific survey, a caregiver survey, a COVID-19 um, survey that we did during the middle of the pandemic, um, an IO survey, um, and then the, the sexual health in women. So if anyone is interested in participating, and I, I refer to it sort of, sort of as donating your data for the, for the overall good um, of discovery. It's lungcancerregistry.org. It's not a hard URL to find, and I highly encourage you to, to support that effort. Heather does a, does a great job. Evie, you have a question? Yeah, I, have a, um, I was curious. Do other lung cancer groups refer to the registry? Will yeah. they refer patients to it? Yes and no. So when we originally pulled this together, we wanted it to be open access for all, and that included other nonprofits whether they're working specifically in lung cancer or just general cancer. Um, so we did have a couple people jump on board and help with that in the early days, but they pretty quickly fell off. I can say we're the only nonprofit out there running a lung cancer specific um, um, registry. 
and we've we've partnered with with other not necessarily nonprofits, but other groups, and are in conversations right we now with profits for profits. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're in conversations right now yeah. with how we might even be able to expand on some of this work with other nonprofit groups outside of the lung cancer space. Thank you. Sure, Larry. Danielle, can you just speak to who the data is made available to, and if it's anonymized? Mm -hmm because people may yeah, have yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. concern about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So everything is anonymous. Nothing's given away with your name and your social security number. So um, it, it's all anonymous information. And it's shared with researchers who become part of the registry itself. So it's not just like this is open information and anybody with a, with a computer can get in. The researchers and the scientists actually register to become part of this registry. They're vetted through this process and then given access. Now I'm going to talk about alchemy a little bit. Um, so there are currently five studies in alchemy revolving around IO, ALK, uh, KRAS, and epidemi of young lung cancer. Um, we, then 2023, we did hire a new permanent full-time position, um, a clinical project manager, manager. Her name is Erica. She's fantastic. Alchemy's uh, PI, um, which is a primary investigator for one of the studies, uh, Mark Awad, who's an MD-PhD from Dana-Farber, was the recipient, for those of you who were able to attend our gala this year, um, of our Asclepius Award uh, for his work, and he's specifically working on some of this ALK stuff. Mm -hmm. We had 60 new patients enrolled across the lung cancer studies within Alchemy, and I, I touched on it before, but I think it's important enough to, to touch on it again, that the single largest Alchemy trial budget accepted by a pharma-sponsored funder of $1.33 million is Alchemy 023, and that is a succeed study looking um, at small cell lung cancer. And like that, that will almost bring me to tears because we've worked so hard and, and, and have done so many good things. And it, for it to be acknowledged in this sort of right. m magnitude in this way, I think is fantastic. Yeah. In 2024, they're planning on launching Alchemy 018. And this is in tandem or in collaboration with our healthcare delivery team. And that's a turnaround time study looking at in the community centers if biomarker testing can be done wherever you might be diagnosed or wherever your biopsy happened. Can we time to treatment? Can we shorten that window and what that looks like um, if we don't have to send it out and then wait for it to be processed and then wait for the results to come back? So that, go ahead. Can I, I'd, I'd just like to tell a little story about Lisa. Briggs in Australia. And this is one of our earlier studies. One of yeah. our earlier studies, and it was the young lung cancer uh, study. And she wanted to be in the trial. And she couldn't be in the trial because she was living in Australia. And Australia wouldn't allow the uh, tissue to be shipped in a vial. It, didn't, it wasn't approved by I know, really ridiculous, right? The who, who's watching this However they, however they right. housed the... However they, yeah. you know, uh, look into that. Collected it, yeah. So she said, no, no, I'm, I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to do this. She said, I'm going to come to California, and then I want to give you my tissue when I get to California. Glad, yeah. So we all sat around, and we looked around, and went, hmm, well, this is interesting. Let's see what we can do about this. So she came with her family. And she went to a hotel. We sent a phlebotomist up to the hotel to, um, to take her uh, tissue. And um, she was in the trial the next day. I want to clarify, we weren't doing biopsies in the hotel room. We were just pulling, we were, we were doing the blood, tissue. blood draws. Right. Yeah. yeah, we were doing yeah. blood draws, sorry. <laughs> but it was, for a, it was for a biopsy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, our, our foundation has always been, don't tell us no. We can figure out a way sooner or later to get it done, whatever it might well, and be. And I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating and fantastic about alchemy is decentralizing these trials so people anywhere can, right. can participate. Right. And um, we can do sort of some of those earlier studies to inform and, and provide information for some yep. of the larger studies. And genomics of young lung is a, is a perfect example of that because you could be anywhere in the world um, and provide your samples. Um, and one of the things that this was another study through Alchemy that was published on and um, presentations were given and posters were made everywhere looking at lung cancer in people under the age of 40. And um, what they did find through that study 
is upwards of 80% of these people did have targetable mutations. Um, and we only looked for mutations we knew of at the right. time, right? right? Since then, right. other things have happened. Right. So something is different um, in this younger population, which brings me to, to this sort of final uh, piece. And um, this is something that's been in the works for a long time, but the MOU has been signed. The work will start in 2024. Um, and it's a collaborative effort with Dana-Farber, GoTo, and Alchemy. And it's an extension of another study that ran through Alchemy called Inherit, looking at EGFR T790M as a germline mutation, so something you might be born with. We just published on that a couple of months ago. Yep. So this is taking the good work and discovery that came from Inherit and moving that needle forward, right? In a way where if we can identify and prove that lung cancer is an inheritable or genetic disease, how might that impact the way we're looking at, at screening um, and treatment, quite right. honestly, right, right. Acro across the board. So um, we've already raised quite a bit of money specifically uh, for Inherit. We're incredibly proud of this partnership. Like I said, it's a, it's a long time in the making. So mm. that is going to be starting in 2024. Yeah. And these, these two studies, both the Young Lung and uh, Inherit, are something no one else is doing out there. Yeah. In any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah. So. Our Center of Excellence program, I think, and I, again, I know a lot of folks in the room, but those of you watching might not know, um, is a program that has identified, um, it's a designation-based program. We currently have 907 centers around the country who have received one of the 10, sorry, Joelle, if you're watching, I think it's 10 designations. So it's every, is it 10? Yeah, Evie does a lot of the work helping us write our, our funding proposals, so she'll know exactly where I, where I might be messing up explanations of some of these. But it really starts with early detection. It runs through IPNs, or incidental pulmonary nodules, and those are those nodules that are missed. Maybe you were in a car accident, and somebody does a CT scan, and they're like, good news, nothing's broken, and your spleen hasn't ruptured, but nobody's looked at the lungs. And or if they did see something on there, it wasn't discussed with uh, the person to go on and look for that moving forward. So incidental pulmonary nodules are a big bugaboo of mine. Things like that should not go unmissed. But also it runs through proper upfront comprehensive biomarker testing. As I mentioned earlier, patient-centered research. It goes through survivorship, um, health equity, and others. I don't know what I'm missing there. <laughs> but there's, there's quite a few. Um, like I said, we, we actually grew to 907 this year, including one new VA facility. Um, and there's 15 new applications in process. We had our Center of Excellence Summit in Washington, D.C. this past October. I was there. We actually held a, a regional living room. It was a fantastic meeting, and this is where we can bring folks from the centers together, and we, we can push information, relevant information, on what's happening with lung cancer right now to yeah. them. And so much of the beauty of this is we're teaching the community docs how to do this. Yeah. you know, in these 900 Working sites. Working with them, yeah. And, and they want to. They want to learn and they want to uh, do this. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Joelle and her team have been incredibly busy expanding this program, adding sort of these adjunct um, sort of other program areas to it. One being our Global Knowledge Center for Lung Cancer. And this is a provider education program. So we can roll out and push out provider education to the community centers, uh, sort of PR, PRN or as, as we want to. Um, there's been an uptake in users, 150% um, of increase in course enrollments in 49 states and 19 countries worldwide. So there's a, there's a big need, particularly in the community setting, to reach or to, for, for access to information like this, even from the healthcare providers. Yeah. Um, as I already mentioned, the turnaround time study with Alchemy, and then um, this sort of is a um, and in tandem also excellence in healthcare delivery working with our policy team and it's an extension of our MRU with the VA for another three years. Um, that's from some of the work that we're doing in screening and early detection. She also d developed a lung cancer core curriculum um, and what this really is is, and we pi well, not piloted it, we launched it at the COE summit and I thought this was a brilliant idea because one of the things that we know is navigators are key within these centers to help push patients correctly through this process. And she set up this curriculum so it doesn't have to be a nurse navigator, it can be a patient navigator, a person navigator receiving this training in order to help better 
the lung cancer programs at the centers that they're working at. That was a wildly huge success. Um, it was one of the first sessions to fill up, so they actually opened it up and expanded um, access to folks um, being able to, to access that information. Um, Joelle worked really, really hard and received a PCORI grant. For those of you who don't know what PCORI is, it's a Patient Center Oriented Research Engagement Award. They do not hand these out like candy. These are very, very, very hard to get, and it's a wildly com competitive sort of space. And so GoTo received the award. Joelle did a lot of the yeoman's work, and I think Abby probably helped with a little bit of it. Um, and it's about building capacity and patient engagement within a stigmatized lung cancer community. And this kind of points back to what I was saying earlier about how do we bring lung cancer out of the shadows. And I think we've done great over the last 15, 16, 17, 18 years, <laughs> but not enough, right? Like not enough. I still exactly. talk to- Exactly, I mean, we've done it over 16 years. Yeah, yeah 17 years. I mean, it, yeah. I still talk to patients regularly. Michelle talks yeah. to them all the time. People are terrified. They've never met another lung cancer patient. They don't know where to turn for information. They don't know how to have conversations with their healthcare providers. I mean, and, and it's a big problem. So we're thrilled for our, um, Joelle and her team. But um, you know, it's you know, we all we all grow up to think that you know doctors are magicians, and nurses are magicians, and all these people are you know they know everything, and you just go to them, and everything's going to be just ducky, and it's not. Yeah. It's just not always the case. So, um, you know, you have to learn how to fight for yourself and fight for the information you need to, to survive. And uh, you have to work at just don't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it for you because nope. it's not going to happen. It's very true. And then there's a LIFE project, and that LIFE stands for Leveraging Patient Advocacy and Faith-Based Partnerships to Educate, Activate, and Prepare Black Communities to Improve <coughs> Survival from Lung Cancer another mouthful, but that's really community outreach and engagement. We're piloting this work in Tennessee. Some of it was already done, and you guys may have heard us talk about Alcase in the past, which um, happened in Alabama. Um, so we'll see what comes of that, but we're really excited to um, have received the funding for that. Community engagement, Jen's not here tonight, but we had a great year when it came to events and really pulling the community together. We had five events uh, in seven cities, Florida, Texas, uh, Pennsylvania, we had the Summer Jam, which of course is a national if not global event, and then we have the three 5Ks in um, California. Um, we increased the number of participants 60%, which is huge. Coming back from COVID, as I'm sure you guys have heard, has been a, a monumentous effort. People are still unsure, unafraid, don't want to be in groups, not sure how to even be in groups anymore. Um, so the events team has, has done an incredible job, led by Jen, and I know a lot of you in the room know her. She's got a, a, a fantastic group working um, with her to try to increase those numbers, and the 60% number, I think, uh, speaks, speaks volumes. And the interesting, one of the interesting sort of tidbits or facts is most often when somebody registers for an event and you ask them why they chose to register, it's usually, oh, I have a family or member or a friend who was diagnosed, and this year, um, the number one reason is that I just want to help. This is my first time ever, and I just want to help. So we're really attracting sort of some new people even outside of their family friend space to come back and support the cause. Um, we also had two golf tournaments, three endurance marathons. There was, oh boy, New York, Hawaii, and then the U.S. Marine Corps Marathon. And then, of course, our gala, which was just in November, where this lovely lady um, was oh so justly honored um, for all of her work in the past two decades that she has dedicated to this disease. And for those of you who don't know, and I know a lot of you contributed to it, we set up a Bonnie J. Dario Legacy Fund um, in her honor to support what the things that we know are important to her and her mission and her vision. And we raised right around $1.7 million for that fund right out of the chute and I can't thank you all enough. I mean, I think um, it also speaks to um, you and um, your vision and the work and all of us foot soldiers over here. Foot who soldiers, are, no. <laughs> who are, You're not who are foot out there foot getting, getting the work done. Yeah. But we've really tried to, and Emily and um, Ayers, who I think a lot of you may or may not know, and her team are really trying to figure out better ways to diversify our funding opportunities um, so that we can. I mean, 
We are a nonprofit organization, right? We are dependent on the kindness of others in order to keep this good work going. Right. Right. Um, one of the things I think we need to do more, maybe not as long-winded as I'm doing it tonight, but is have conversations like this so that people who are supporting us know where their dollars are going and what type of impact that it's having. Um, stay tuned for our 2023 impact report, um, which will be coming out hopefully in, um, in Q1. Government Affairs and Health Policy. This one will be quick, and Elridge, if you're watching, Elridge is like my sister from another mother, and she spearheads our government affairs, um, particularly around the Voices Summit and a lot of the stuff that happens up on the Hill. And every time we have a conversation about this, it doesn't matter how many years it's been, I'm like, can you explain that to me again? Because I'm just like <laughs> uh, politically uncharged to, to understand a lot of it. But what I can say is, um, our Voices Summit last year was a, a huge success. Larry, you were there. In fact, our very own Larry uh, received an award uh, while, we were, while we were there last year. This year's summit is coming up March 3rd through 5th. Don't quote me on that, but it's like right there. 2nd through 5th, 3rd through 5th, 2024. I will be um, in attendance again on the Hill. This year, we did a reintroduction of the Women in Lung Cancer Research and Preventative Services Act with the Women's Health Coalition. Um, fiscal year 24, we, uh, in 2023, we secured $25 million. We did get a presidential complimation. Complimation? No. <laughs> Look at, I have only had three sips of my wine, I promise. Proclamation <laughs> <I have> <laughs> um, from President Biden. Um, oh, yeah, um, yeah, 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 um, yeah, Acknowledging yeah. Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Right. Um, as uh, right, November. <clears throat> and Anita and her team are doing a lot of this work on the coverage and reimbursement and um, and right now, we have state biomarker coverage in 13 states, which isn't enough. We know it's not enough, and we're working hard state by state to ensure that people it, One person have, can't do it. Yeah. You know, it's not possible yeah. for one person to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She works hard. It's Marketing hard. and communications is sort of like IT and like administrative, uh, administration and finance, those overarching departments that do the work that help us sustain and reach the, 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 the people that we need to. And I think the thing that I wanna focus on in marketing, and if you haven't seen it, let me know and I'll, I'll send it to you, but was the work that was done um, on our PSA this year. So Tony Goldwyn, who's an actor, some of you may or may not know who he is, he lost his mother to lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And so through a, a connection with a, one of our board members, we started having conversation and he was like, you know what, I wanna, I wanna do something, I wanna put my voice and my stamp behind the good work that GoTo is doing. And we know how hard it is to find celebrities to come and speak out on behalf of this disease. So with the magic and the help of our very own James Hall, so a, who I know um, a lot of you also know from Onyx and Ash, we were able to pull together. We had a very short amount of time with Tony to get this done. So it was sort of this all hands or only, only the hands that must be there on deck because we didn't have time to waste to get it done. But I want to talk a little bit about the reach of, um, um, of that PSA and I jumped ahead. So it's, it's going out in a phased approach. So the first one, it started in November, obviously it's running through May. Second one is May through December. So we're gonna, utilizing different channels, whether it's radio spots, social media, TV, to see what has the, the most bang for its buck. I really wanna find the number. Okay, so the impressions across the board. So this is audio, programmatic video, YouTube, native, some other acronyms I don't understand. We've had 1.674181. So 1.68 million impressions just since November 1st with this PSA, and that's with a total of 15,158 users. So these people are really activating um, around this PSA. It didn't hurt that Tony, who we found out, um, I guess manages his own Instagram account, did post it on his account, and so we got a ton of hits from, um, from that. I will also say, that the outreach that's been happening, maybe because of the PSA or partly in part because of the PSA, but also in part because some of the work that we've been trying to do in increasing awareness around our brand and who we are and what we're doing. We were up 32.4% on our website users. So that's a big number to me. To me. I, see, yeah. I keep seeing yeah. um, um, Evie nod. Social media too, this was interesting. So Zach, who's on the marketing team, who has, uh, I don't know how long Zach's been here, but not too terribly long. But he's done an amazing job with he's, some of our social media. He's great. Yeah, he's adorable. And um, through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or now X, LinkedIn, and YouTube, impressions is 18.7 million. 
which is up 72% in engagement of that is with 296,000 folks. So that's up 69%, which is also very, very exciting. So now what I do, why I love my job, right? <laughs> I, like I, like I, I know a little bit about all of this stuff, um, but I know a lot about what my area of responsibility is um, here, and that's um, to serve the people at risk and diagnosed with lung cancer in the best way possible to ensure the best outcomes for each and every one of them. Like period, hard stop. Like that is my goal year after year, day after day, month after month. Michelle, who I know a lot of you know on my team, um, but there's Nicole and Maureen and Miranda and Amy who are all behind the scenes making sure that all of this happens. So um, I wanna start with the helpline because again, during COVID, like a lot of things, we saw these dips, right? People weren't calling, people, people were not paying as much attention to their lung cancer because they were too worried about their COVID. And so a lot of, a lot of dips happened. But um, it, since 2021, in 2022, we were up 33.9% in helpline callers. And this year we're up 39.7%. So we're seeing you know, the, that curve kind of move in the direction that we want it to. One of the very interesting things this year Again, 58% of the callers were new. They weren't callbacks. They weren't people who have hit a crossroads. They were new people who had never contacted um, GoTo before. And I'm also happy to say that, um, that we, we do a satisfaction survey. Some of you may or may not know if you've ever called the helpline. And it's one simple question, like how would you rate you know, this experience? And we have 100% satisfaction on our helpline. So our helpline team, um, I think, does a really incredible job of supporting people where they are. Um, we also had calls from 43 states and 21 countries. So also really big. Michelle's one of our helpline um, answers along with Maureen and Miranda. Our phone buddy program, Larry, I don't know if you wanna say a thing or two about what it means to be a phone buddy, but um, um, we had 133 matches this year, which is a good number. The phone buddy program helps me give back to the community. But I think in reality, the person who is newly diagnosed, doesn't know where to turn, can talk to someone who's walked in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And I think the objective overall is to provide comfort, provide support, help them prepare to go to their oncologist with questions and to better understand what lung cancer is for them. I think you hit the nail on the head with that, finding comfort and support from somebody walking in the shoes because I can talk till I'm blue in the face to somebody who's been diagnosed with lung cancer, but I can't understand the feeling right behind the diagnosis of lung cancer the way that someone who's been diagnosed and is walking in those shoes does. And Miranda, uh, who's on the support services team, does a really fantastic job. I know those of you who know her, she's one of your favorite people and I couldn't agree more. Um, but she does a really fantastic job of trying to match people as like as she can. So if you're a male between this age range and you have grandkids or, or children or you don't have children or you're single or whatever, she really tries to match you that closely. And I think the really important part of the match, in addition to the personal part, is the great majority of the match of the people who are talking to a phone buddy like me are people who have the same mutation who are we're we're experiencing the same treatment everyone responds differently to treatment in so many ways but the experience of someone who's had that treatment who can help you understand and help you know where to go to get help with side effects, to have questions to ask your doctor about that particular mutation, that particular treatment. It's very comforting. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, <coughs> I said this at the beginning, but it's one of the things I miss most about the around the room that we used to do before every living room, because there was a lot of learning opportunities when people were having conversations to say, I'm going through X, Y, or Z, and then somebody from across the room would be like, hold on, I got something for X, Y, Z, right? Or, or I know what you should, how you should have those conversations, which brings me into gathering hope because I think that's really, we've tried, tried to create, although in a virtual sort of environment, 
an online support community that we just started in 20, late 2021. So it's a little over a year old. Huh? Two years old? And we've increased our registered participants by 112%. So something's working there, and we, we know that there is a, a strong need for people to be able to connect with one another in this very meaningful way. And it's not just connection and advice. I mean, it doesn't take much more than looking around the room to say these are lifelong friendships that develop, right? And support that you guys can give to one another is such an incredible piece. Well, you know, I um, you know, I talk to patients, you know, a lot as well, and um, I find that, and and some of you will relate to this. When you're talking to the patient, you find out they really know nothing. Yeah. You know, they went to a doctor, and the doctor said you have lung cancer, and um, then they uh, write up a, a few things for you to, you know, talk to your primary physician for. Then that's it. Maybe. That's it. They don't know what a mutation is. I mean, you ask them, well, what kind of a mutation do you have? Did you have testing? I don't, yeah. I don't know what a mutation is. Yeah. I don't know what... You yeah, know, and I think that's where is. a lot of the support services programming is aimed towards sort of tackling that challenge of right. becoming an empowered and educated patient yeah. and in ways that will make somebody feel most comfortable. Because when you were diagnosed, you would no more have gone to a support group meeting no. or, or asked for a phone buddy or any of that, right? And I think no. it, in, in general, a lot of people feel that way. But if they can be talked into doing it, there's not a one of them who doesn't say, I wish I had done this sooner. Right. Right? right. I wish I had engaged I wish in I this knew way what a sooner. Was. Yeah. I, did, I yeah. wish I knew what a targeted mutation yeah. was. I, I wish I knew that. And, and I uh, wish I had made a connection with somebody else diagnosed. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yeah. And bring them in and keep them simple. And um, uh, it, it works. Yep. Um, so Miranda's been able to match people in 34 states, which I think is also pretty amazing. Yeah. We did launch a small cell community online support community in 2022 that kind of sits alongside our general lung cancer support group, and that's through a platform called Health Unlocked. Um, and our small cell online community jumped 46% this year. So um, we're making those strides in the small cell space that, that make me so incredibly proud. Our publications distribution this year um, was about 60, 61,000 um, shipped, so hard copies shipped, uh, and then downloads um, just a little under 10,000. That number was actually a little down from last year, but I think we were expecting that, um, and I'm happy with that number given all the rebrand work and the health, lit health literacy work. We've taken our, our entire library and sort of turned it on its head to ensure that whoever has access to, to this information can easily understand the information that they're being provided. So big shout out to Amy Camp Schroeder on my team for all of her work um, on that. And not to mention we created six new um, materials. W the living room uh, community, which is uh, an online uh, sort of register for the community so that we can remind you, A, about living rooms that are coming up, but B, if you can't make it, we can provide you with either show notes and or links to relevant information or living rooms that you wanted to have that you would uh, like to watch and that was up 48 percent I should tell you guys these are all these numbers are through November so that doesn't even include the the last month but um, through November a little over 38,000 views of the lung cancer living room um, in 38 countries um, the top five um, countries were US India Hong Kong Philippines and Canada um, and new countries uh, in 2023 were Cambodia, Bangladesh, North uh, Macedonia, and Uganda. So it's really fascinating for us, and that's helpful to us, especially when we're thinking about translating materials, you know, who, who's coming to us and what, what are their needs. I already talked about the FSG work that we did, and we had published phase one of phase two of S FSG, was to take all of that information, and then um, Nicole and Maureen, who are on the PSS team, have been spearheading these health equity efforts and are working with all of the other departments to integrate into their strategic planning some of these health equity strategies and these learnings that came from phase one. So the first part of that has happened with all of the departments, and the second half uh, would be happening in early 2024. Um, so we've done a lot. That's all.
but that's all. Um, but I do want to talk about some of the things a lot of you have participated and seen us talk about Best of ASCO or what's come out of ASCO or, or World Long. And um, there were three different approvals that happened this year. One is Gavrito, and that's happened in the RET gene fusion. One is Braftovi in combination with Mectovi. You know, I'm giving you the um, generic names. Um, and that's for BRAF, um, uh, V600E mutation. And then Pember, or Keytruda um, is has been approved neoadjuvant and adjuvant for early stage disease. This has all been a big thing over the last 24 months where both targeted therapies and immunotherapies have been looked, um, looked at in the early staging space because prior to some of these discoveries, even if you were found early and you had surgery, the recurrence rate was still way higher um, than, than it needed to be. So we're really excited um, about those drug approvals. And then the data showing promise. Again, we gave updates after, after World Lung in September, um, but one um, in particular um, around small cell revolves around um, a third line therapy option for people diagnosed with small cell lung cancer in the history of ever, or in the history of never, has there been a third line therapy option for people with small cell lung cancer? And then obviously- Let alone a first line. <laughs> yeah, obviously um, more happening and coming down the pike in targeted therapies, immunotherapies, and combination therapies. And one of the things I wanna note here, and then I'm closing up, is these types of approvals and promises, and even the good work that we do, are only achievable because of people like you. I mean, honestly, like, if it weren't for you all either spreading the word, supporting us, or more importantly, participating in clinical trials, and I don't think people are thanked near enough for their participation um, without it, and I know a lot of you have heard me say this before, but it, it, it makes me crazy, just thank you. Thank you, Rick, <laughs> right? Thank you, Larry. I mean, thank you anyone who has participated in trials. Joanne, I know you have. It's such an important part of this process and is such a benefit not only to the people in the trials, fingers crossed, I mean, that's the hope, it's right? The coming up but it's the them. ones coming up behind them. And it's the it's people that participate in, in studies like this that are allowing for just wait for the next best thing, for the people who are on the current best thing. So yeah. thank you um, to those of you who do um, participate. Thank you for all the work you do and all the help you do with other patients. You have no idea um, how much they appreciate that. And we see pa patients come in here all the time and they leave and they go, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Are you kidding me? What? Mm -hmm. You know, and it, you know, I'm looking forward to the day where they go, yeah, I knew that. We know that. We're doing this. We're doing and That's what we want them to do. We want them to be informed and we want them to know, you know, what to ask for. So. It's starting to happen. Yeah, it is. I really feel compelled to say this, having been a, a caregiver and a patient, and now as a volunteer. The, I see this conveyor belt in front of me as you were talking. You know, the Lucille ball, and he, she's with Ethel, and the candy is coming down <laughs> the line, and you know, you gotta get them the it's coming fast and furious. Like well, I know, because I've counted, the number of programs that you've gotta get funding for is about, it's over 30, I think. And you have to make the case every year. And the data helps to make the case. Yeah, right. But you don't, that doesn't just happen. Right. It takes money, it takes people, it Time. takes systems, it takes all of that. And so, um, and yes, a lot of the funding comes from corporations, pharmaceutical, biotech, et cetera. But it's also from individuals and every one person sitting in this room has benefited so much from all of those programs. And it is a heavy lift. Um, and all nonprofits go, go through it. And I, I've been in the nonprofit world all my life. But I can really say that whatever is given here is saving lives. And that's the way I always feel when we submit a grant, and whether it's one grant or 14 grants, it's a heavy lift every, every, every year. So thank you to everybody who um, uses the services and supports um, go to and loves the organization because it really is saving lives. Thank, thank you, Abby. you. Abby. Thank you, Abby. And so many of you in this room and, and online um, have given back in so many ways um, and we can't 
thank you enough for your support. I mean, we just, we really can't because we, we do it for you and, and we couldn't do it, we couldn't or we wouldn't want to do it without you, whether well, it's your it voice. we do it for you, but we do it with you. Yeah, a thank you to our panelists, which I usually say, but that's just you and I today, so <laughs> whatever. Um, to everybody watching live, those watching post live, to Karen for pulling together this fantastic feast for all of us um, today. To Penn Media for coming in, um, lugging all this equipment in here um, and helping to make it so that we can air it to all of you um, in the coziness of your own living rooms. To Michelle over here for moderating um, and to the entire GoTo team, I really want to give a shout out. They work tirelessly um, on each and every one of these things and more that we weren't even able to get into today. So big thank you to the GoTo team. And then of course our supporters, and this is a list I have to read. And I say it every time, but it's a long list because our supporters believe in the good work that this programming provides. So Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Isai Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Janssen Oncology, Merck, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Thank you all for so much of your support. Until 2024, happy holidays to everyone and cheers and big hugs and wishes for a healthy, happy 2024. Thanks, guys. So I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're.